What's up, YouTube? So I think I've got a fun thought experiment for you. Might seem a little strange, but if you're on this channel, you may be used to that. Um, and maybe you've already thought about this in some capacity, but, but regardless, I think this may be a fun perspective, right? Um, I had this idea for, for a long time that language, perception, and synesthesia are the exact same thing. Fundamentally, at their lowest you know, level, they, they're, they're the same thing. And I say that because synesthesia can be described as the association between different modalities, ways of perceiving and, and, and saying what something is or isn't, right? That's what language is. Language is a way to say what something is or isn't at its most fundamental philosophical layer. Um, synesthesia is doing the same thing, and that's what perception is. And if you want to think about this in a more abstract way, one way to do that is, and this is something I used to think about as a kid a lot, is, is you know, if I reduced and removed as much context from perception as possible, what would I kind of be left with? I would say, you know, maybe there's, let's say I have, you know, let's say a white and black square, right? Just simple binary values, you, you know, you, you can identify the black in accordance to the white and the white in accordance to the black, right? Pretty simple. But the only way you can even tell that difference is if there's something similar, right? They're explained in like terms. You're, you're basically saying there's sameness and difference and difference and sameness, right? Simultaneously. Because you can only say those are black or white if they're sharing this category of color or luminance in this example. That's what we do with language. That's what synesthesia is when we create these associations, right? That sameness. And so, and so, Flushing this out a bit more, um, you know, in some cases of synesthesia, you'll have, you know, uh, a feeling or color associated with a word or a number, or you'll have a shape associated with a sound or whatever, right? Well, what do we do when we learn typical languages? We have a shape associated with the sound, we have feelings associated with them, we have images, you know, we have all these types of associations. So, like, for instance, if you look at, you know, the words on your screen right now, not in this video, outside of the video frame, right, on YouTube. Um, you know, if it's, if it's, let's say it's displayed in English, right? If you didn't know what English was and you had some completely foreign language, you had no idea what English was and you looked at it, you would at most see them as sort of shapes or you may see them in terms of your frame of reference, which would be your native language, right? So, you know, if, <laughs> in Mandarin Chinese, there's a couple words that you don't want to say you know, there, there's words in Mandarin that sound like words you don't want to say in English, right? You probably know the ones that I'm talking about, right? And that's sort of a good example of the way our frames of reference, our priors, will literally shape and act as a lens at which we pursue, you know, we perceive the future, uh, you know, piece of information. So, another way to think about this could be, let's say we have one person with you know, standard normal American English over here. And then over here we have uh, someone that's created a conlang, you know, like a community constructed language that's using the exact same shapes of English letters and the exact same sounds of English letters. But the internal meaning and modeling that they're using to describe this in their head is completely different. So A will still sound like A, B and C will still sound the same, but they're gonna mean something completely different. They can even be grammatically organized in the same way. All the person has to do is learn you know, they can have a book of, of English or whatever, an English book, and as long as they're reading that and associating that with different ideas or things in their head, they're essentially creating a different type of a language. Even though, you know, you know, you know when, we, when we listen to them speak, they'll be saying the exact same thing. They'll be saying the same thing in terms of how it sounds, but meaning-wise it's different. And this could also be thought of in terms of the ambiguity and the context of language and, and general passive conversations, or especially in forms of art like music. You know, I love, I love, I love ambiguous lyricism. I, I really do. Um, you know, I, some of my favorite artists are like, so I love, obviously, you know, I love Eminem, I love Aesop Rock, uh, LP, right? Um, I like Lupe Fiasco. Um, I love Nirvana songs. I love, um, I love System of a Down. Like, S System of a Down, in particular, has some really interesting lyrics. I still don't know what the kombucha mushroom people are in that, in that song, but um, you know, the level of ambiguity in, this, in the case of a song is really fun because it doesn't, it doesn't say much about the song, but it says more about how you're experiencing the song because when there's ambiguity, it usually 
clarifies your bias of what you're viewing, right? It clarifies to you as the agent your way of perceiving things, right? It, it exposes your internal bias or lens of viewing the world, sort of like the analogy of, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? It's kind of like that. And so this also reminds me of like a filmmaking, you know, some of my, my favorite films have been ones that are somewhat ambiguous. And I know like in terms of, you know, big budget director, somebody like Chris Nolan likes to talk about, from what I remember, he doesn't generally like to disclose the exact meaning, intended meaning of his films. He likes to leave a little bit of, of things that are subject to interpretation and ambiguity. And you can, you can have, you know, two people, right, watching the exact same thing and they'll derive completely different conclusions or ways of thinking what it was even talking about, right? And you know, in normal language, like when we have words that have multiple meanings or the context of, of, of a word will change what it means. And so that's, that's just a really interesting dynamic that you sort of see in multiple scales of agency and cognition, right? And so yeah, so now, you know, another example in a way that I tried to experiment with this is with something called an olfactory language or smell language, right? So self-explanatory, I hope, right? And what I'd done is I, had, you know, this was many, many years ago, but I'd taken, um, I'd taken, you know, colognes and perfumes, and I had put them in like these dropper bottles, and I'd pattern these into different shapes and things that would be like letters and words on a piece of paper. And I, what I would do is I'd, you know, go on the paper and smell read that left to right, like I was reading something, in, you know, like a normal string of text, but it was smell reading, right? Like I was just sniffing it, right? Don't draw a bad analogy with that. I was sniffing, right? And and so pretty quickly, like really within minutes, I noticed, because what, what I was doing is, is I was, as I was smell reading this, I was also associating each of those patterns with some type of either another smell or either, um, you know, another, uh, you know, visual or an image or a sound or, or an idea or, right, or a concept, right? And I noticed by the time I was done doing this for a couple of minutes that there's this afterglow effect, this leakage, this sort of attentional leakage effect a perceptual leakage effect, where I, I, I first noticed it when I looked at the piece of paper, just sort of glanced at it, you know, more intently, right? And I noticed that the paper no longer felt like a paper to me. It was a paper, but it was felt in a different way. It felt like a smell, right? And it wasn't that it was the smell of the paper, like if I go and sniff the smell of that paper, right? I wasn't smelling the paper. I was smelling and experiencing subjectively, internally, this, this new sort of, you know, generated, auto-generated smell from the way I was learning this language. And I noticed that this was transferring over to everything else for a bit, right? So I, what I'd noticed is that my sense of self was a smell, right? Other words and ideas and concepts I had in my head, when I thought of, you know, the, the table or the pencil or the pen or the computer or the phone, whatever it is, all this stuff would be thought of in terms of, of um, in terms of a smell. Just like I had a visual way of thinking of that, you know, I could visually think of it and, you know, uh, you know uh, abstract it in different ways and combine it with other things that was now represented internally very, very viscerally in terms of a smell. And, you know, the, the original idea for this stuff came from this, this some type of um, perceptual disassociative thing that I have where it took me a second to actually realize what I was looking at. Like, you know, I would look at, you know, in this case, a chair in front of me. I still have it to a degree, but I have to consciously remind myself that, hey, this is a chair. This is not something else. So, you know, I was, I was very good at um, being divergent, right? And, and I sort of had two poles. I was either very divergent or I was forced to, like, mimic something because I couldn't reach this middle point. So it was a skill I had to build up over a while. And this was particularly more jarring when I was younger. I've gotten better at it, right? But that was one of the things that really forced me into thinking about these things, right? Um, and I actually think this is also potentially what happens during dream states and other altered states of consciousness, which we can get to in, in you know, maybe another video. But one of the things I want to sort of finish up touching on in this video is this idea of informational ambiguity and that language and perception and synesthesia are the same thing because they're just associations among things, right? And, you know, part of the reason for the olfactory language thing is, is, is I was wondering, you know, how do other animals, for instance, perceive the world, right? Because, you know, dogs in particular have a pretty good sense of smell compared to humans, but they, 
how do they model the world? Right, because when you, when, you know, because of this thing that I had when I think about things, I was like, you know, all right, I'm thinking of this visually, I'm thinking of this in terms of a sound, or I'm thinking of this in terms of a texture, or a word, or whatever, right? But could you do that in terms of smells? It seemed pretty reasonable to me that you can. And I had a level of experimentation with, with this too, right? Um, and I thought dogs, you know, maybe dogs, their way of, of lensing the world through smell and olfaction could give them some type of advantage for certain tasks. And, and that was part of the reason why I came up with this idea of the olfactory language. So I, I think there's really interesting things you can do when you realize that language may be the mask of reality and perception itself. And I think this may potentially explain a lot of the neurodivergence amongst humans and even animals, and even AI to a degree. Um, so I think this is something I'll, I'll touch on on other videos, but um, just thought this would be kind of interesting to discuss on a whim right now.